Wonderful to have a professor standing in. Nice it raises stuff? your stock oh, thank so you very significantly. Much, so. uh, the reason Luke is with us is to talk about what dogs can teach us about human health. Yes, strange one, uh, one level, Anton. But uh, dogs are very wonderful creatures, as you know. Many pet owners love their dogs for all kinds of reasons. But it turns out they bring an added benefit. Certain breeds of dog get certain diseases, more common, say, than in other breeds. And scientists have studied these dogs, try to figure out why. And lo and behold, there's a difference in a gene in a particular dog, say. The same thing happens in humans. And so we're learning from dogs what might cause certain diseases. So it turns out they're our best friend in more ways than one, really. And of course, there is a pre-existing, I remember uh, years ago reading research that said that children brought up in homes that have a dog have much lower instances of uh, certain respiratory conditions in adulthood by virtue, in, in part they think because the dogs are filthy and they expose do. them to a load of stuff, but they are healthier they in do. adulthood. There's really good evidence for that, Anton. It's called the hygiene hypothesis. In other words, if you have a bit of dirt when you're a child, it trains your immune system to behave itself less likely to get asthma. Dogs are a wonderful way to keep the house a little bit more dirty, shall we say, on that side. So that's another, another benefit to dogs. So what are the various areas that we are gaining this insight into in terms of dogs' genes? What are the diseases that we've gained a useful look at? Yeah, it's a funny one because, you see, we domesticated dogs 10,000 years ago, by the way. That's when we took a wolf and began to breed it into a less tame wolf, I guess. But certain genes carried with those, that breeding process, and there was inbreeding among different dogs as well. And those genes then would persist, you see. It's a bit of a sort of a, a, a carryover, I guess, from those days. The big one's obesity, and, and this is why I'm talking about it this week, because last week this was published. Uh, certain breeds of dog, in particular Labradors, they keep eating. I don't know if you've had a Labrador. They, they never stop eating. And then they're, they're at risk of obesity, and the owners know this. And they found a gene called POMC. That's the name of it. It's a bit of a mouthful. But the gene POMC is defective in those dogs. And what POMC is actually doing is it's making them hungry all the time and they can't stop eating. And between meals, they're still hungry. That, that's one aspect of this. And then the second is um, they burn less calories when they're resting because of POMC as well. So it turns out if you have too much POMC, it makes you feel hungry and then you don't burn as many calories. And that's, that's the reason they think why Labradors are more, more inclined to become obese. Which, of course, in a Labrador is very useful for training because if it's that food motivated, you can use it to learn their skills. It's not great for a human. Are, are, the, are the genetics of a dog sufficiently similar to human that we can map insights one to the other? We can, indeed. Yeah, we're all mammals, you see, and we all have a common ancestor many, many millions years ago, basically. You know, so are, are, we're more similar to mice, by the way, than dogs, strangely. But there is similarities and humans have the POMC gene as well. And now because of the work in dogs, they're looking in humans and POMC is a key appetite regulator in humans as well. So, so through that study on Labradors, the focus has shifted to POMC. And there are very rare cases in human where POMC is, is misbehaving as well. And that's causing obesity in humans. So in other words, the translation from the dog into the human then is even more relevant. And of course, what that means, Anton, is if you, if you could block POMC, and modulate it, you may have a treatment for obesity. And as you know, there's lots of interest in obesity with all kinds of drugs. Yeah, Ozempic, as we mentioned yeah, earlier. But, uh, but POMC, targeting POMC could be another way to treat obesity, which would be marvellous, given the problems of obesity in the human population. And have they made early inroads into the study of POMC in treatment terms in Labrador? No, no, it's early days, yeah. So they're, they're in the middle of that now, I guess, and they're beginning to initiate all these different studies. Um, and of course, the trick will be to develop drugs target Without the work on dogs, the drug companies wouldn't be said, let's go after POMC. So the work on the Labradors has inspired them. And again, because of this situation in humans, it, it could well translate from dog into human. And as I say, because obesity is such a huge issue for all kinds of reasons, this could be another approach for, for handling obesity. The other one that's interesting that they found in, in Labradors is um, problems in copper storage. That's right. Yes, another, there's another one, right? So that's a strange one. So copper is very important for our health. In case you didn't realise, we need copper in our diet. And the reason we is... We need to be careful with it, though, don't we? It well, can be... There's a risk, yeah. But if you have too much copper, it gets toxic. But certain enzymes in your body need copper to work properly. But the trouble is, of course, too much copper can damage your liver. And again, there's the Bedlington Terrier is a good example. And also the Doberman and the Cocker Spaniel. They're inclined to store too much copper. So they can't get rid of copper as readily as other breeds would do. And that damages their livers. And they found a gene, again, it's called ATP7B, another mouthful, that is defective in those dogs. And lo and behold, Anton, in humans who have copper storage problems, that's rare, but some humans store too much copper and that causes liver injury. The same mutation now has been translated into humans. So again, from studying copper toxicity in dogs, it's relevant 
to these human situations, a disease called Wilson's disease, named after Dr. Wilson, who first described it. Those people have a mutation and then they, they can't secrete copper. So I think they, you can't get rid of the copper from your body, basically, because that, that gene is needed for copper secretion. Is there any likely environmental link between the genetic selection in dogs and humans, given that the two species have been so aligned for so long? Yeah, that's what makes it so useful, actually, because dogs live in the same environment as us. And of course, as the environment often gets the gene to reveal itself or express itself. It's, it's called nature via nurture. In other words, you have a certain nature, but the nurturing reveals it. So the fact that we're living with these dogs and they get the diseases means in humans, we'll be in the same environment and that gene will reveal itself in us as well. Hence, another really good reason why dogs are a great uh, thing to study. It's different to study animals in a lab setting because that's a different environment. But these dogs are in the wild with us, you see. So it's very useful scientifically from that point of view too. Did you ever see the Russian um, guy who tried to emulate the experience of, of wolf dog domestication using foxes. No. Oh, it's brilliant to watch. It was a guy in the 1950s. Uh, he, he was theorising about how long it takes to domesticate an animal. He did with foxes what humans did with wolves and in only about eight years. Did he really? Yeah. He ended up with the same spectrum of types of fox, fox yep. behaviour that suddenly was very like dog behaviour. Remarkable how fast it happened. Yep. The other one that they found, so you've got the uh, copper storage issues, you have issues with obesity and one that you wouldn't associate with dogs Narcolepsy. Narcolepsy. This was one of the first ones, actually, Anton. It's a few years ago now. But again, there's still stuff on it. Dobermans are narcoleptic. Now, lar- narcolepsy. Not great for a watchdog. No, it's not great for a watchdog. So it's a bit strange, isn't it? But they'll suddenly fall asleep, you see, and they have trouble with their sleep wake cycle. And that, that's, that's been known for quite a while. And again, using Dobermans, they found the genetic difference. It's called hypocretin, is the name of this one. Another bit of a mouthful. And they can't make enough hypocretin, really. And that's why they're falling asleep. Now, yet again, Humans are narcoleptic, and again they've found that hypocretin process is different in humans who are narcoleptic. Now, can you believe it? And it began with Dobermans falling asleep suddenly. You know? And again, narcolepsy is a very serious condition, of course. You know? And there are certain treatments already for it. They, they even give them amphetamine, can you believe, to keep them away, humans away, because it's so disturbing for them. And again, this now, there's trials running trying to mimic hypocretin. This is, this is the defective hypocretin system in the Doberman and in humans. So again, if you give a hypocretin mimetic, they call it, you might have a treatment for narcolepsy. And that, that as a treatment, I would imagine, for narcolepsy must bring awful problems because it's one thing to make sure that you don't fall asleep, but you don't particularly want to be on amphetamines all of the time that you're You don't, awake. and that's the severe cases, obviously. There's other treatments as well. And some of the treatments were found um, kind of empirically. And then the other bit on the hypocretin is it turns out your own immune system can destroy the cells that make the hypocretin. And that's another reason for narcolepsy. So again, if you could block the immune attack on the neurons, that would be another way to treat it. And of course, as I say, it's not that uncommon, narcolepsy, actually, in humans. So again, there's a need for... for The treatments that are there have side effects, as we've just mentioned. And this hypocretin pathway, there's real promise that we might be able to target that and, and prevent narcolepsy. Actually, now that I think about it, the prospect of a Doberman on amphetamines, that's really oh, Lord, terrifying. Can you imagine? <laughs> that's right. Make a good guard dog. With it. <laughs> Am I, do I get the sense in all of this, Luke, that whatever about the, the insights that are being derived from dogs for us, that we are on something of the cusp of a revolution in terms of gene-specific and person-specific medicine? Absolutely. That's where this is going on precisely. And it's great science, remember, because if you see something in a dog, the same disease in humans, you map the gene in the dog and lo and behold, it's the same gene in the human that makes it more than likely correct, if you know what I mean. Us scientists love independent lines of evidence. So you can see now gene therapies coming into this precisely. If you could correct the gene for the copper, for instance, that will get rid of Wilson's disease. Correct the hypocretin deficiency, that will get rid of narcolepsy. Now, the trouble is, we're not there yet with gene therapy, as you know, it's still a ways off, it must be said. But there's loads of companies going after gene therapy, and one of them is bound to get it right in the end. You know, So again, there's optimism out there, as ever, that these approaches might actually work. Luke, fascinating as ever. Thank you so much. Luke O'Neill, Professor of Biochemistry at the School of Immunology in Trinity College.